Thank you, Sam. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And looking at the program, I realize I'm representing the state of Virginia. So I'm happy that you're allowing me to come here, and I, I, will, I will do my best. Um, I'm also talking on a very broad topic. You know, plantations, plantation slavery, uh, of course, is huge. You know, stretches over many, many states. Um, and I can only, you know, just touch the surface here. And I will use as a case study a uh, plantation that I know very well, and probably many of you do uh, as well, and that will, be, that will be Mount Vernon. So just briefly talking about plantation slavery, of course, we all know that uh, Virginia and Maryland started off as tobacco colonies, uh, shown down on the left that tobacco is a uh, famously labor-intensive, am I not coming through? is a famously labor-intensive activity. <laughs> We're having fun with microphones today. Uh, labor-intensive labor activity, which of course led to uh, the need for uh, a large labor force, and of course then to um, the, uh, uh, the choice of enslaved labor. Uh, as time passed, of course, the system did change, and on the upper right you see a representation of a major agricultural shift that occurred throughout the Chesapeake, and that was the move towards wheat as they cash crop, wheat and other grains, and this had a major impact on the daily lives of the enslaved working on those types of plantations. Just to put some of this in context, and using just one set of, 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 of numbers, there are many, many, many out there, but this is from the federal census of 1860, and what it represents is that 40% of slaveholders owned fewer, uh, 10 or fewer individuals. Third, only 3% of the slaveholders in, in this particular county in 1860 held more than 45 slaves. Uh, and this goes for the entire region uh, almost uh, throughout uh, the 18th and, uh, and early 19th century, where the uh, large uh, slave holdings were very, very concentrated among a very few individuals. Mount Vernon, of course, uh, ranks uh, in the upper 1% category that we'll be talking about. Why Mount Vernon? Uh, of course, it's the home of, very, of a very important person historically, but it also has a rich um, archive of material with which to interpret the lives of all the individuals who are living on the plantation. So because it's George Washington, uh, his records are, are well preserved. So it's, it's remarkable how much material there is available to us, including the one on the left. George Washington uh, made two inventories of, uh, of his slaves, one in 1786 and one in 1799, where he enumerated the, not only the numbers, but uh, the ages, the activities, the occupations, uh, and where they, where they lived. So there's an enormous amount of information a material that's available to us uh, to bring to this, to, this, to this question. The fellow on the right, uh, very impressive looking, is Hercules. You may have heard of him. Uh, he was George Washington's cook uh, for many, many years, uh, was very well known in the time period, had a very, uh, very large reputation, and we'll get back to him later on uh, when we talk about what happened to George Washington's slaves. So just a snapshot of, from the 1799 inventory uh, by George Washington of the enslaved community at Mount Vernon, there were 277 individuals that were either owned by George Washington or were under his use uh, through his wife's estate. Martha Washington's first husband, Daniel Park Custis, died without a will. And so what that meant was that she was entitled to the use of one third of his estate for her lifetime, and that include, included slaves. And so she brought them to Mount Vernon. So in 1799, when this, uh, this was uh, made up of the total of 277 slaves, 124 of them were actually owned by George Washington, 153 of them were actually dower slaves. And this again had a major impact on uh, the folks there, uh, especially uh, at the end of Washington's life, when he freed his slaves but he could not legally free the dower slaves. And we'll talk about that in a minute, sort of some of the impacts uh, that that had on the folks uh, who were working at Mount Vernon. Uh, 
These tradesmen at the top that you see, these folks are craftspeople, smiths and bricklayers and gardeners. Some of them are specifically there to support the operations of the plantation, uh, but others are there to make money. And uh, Mount Vernon was a major commercial venture, of course, um, and in addition to the crops in the field that Washington was growing, he uh, diversified in a variety of other activities, and it was the, the enslaved workers, of course, who were the ones who were, who were doing this work. The tradesmen, um, most of them were living at the Mansion House Farm. You can see another 40 individuals who are living at the Mansion House Farm. So there's about 90, 90 slaves are living at the Mansion House Farm. The four outlying farms, Muddy Hole, River Farm, Doe Run, and Union Farm, are where the crops uh, are being grown. And so there are substantial groups of enslaved individuals who are living and working on those farms under the direction of an overseer. Uh, the bottom category, past labor, uh, these are, are, are people who are at the stage in their lives where they're no longer uh, expected to work, uh, but they're, they're a part of the category. And of course, this includes men, women, and children. So this is a substantial number of children that are among this group. Uh, we'll wait for questions, I think, at the end, but please keep that in mind. This is Washington's map of the five farms of Mount Vernon uh, that he made in 1793. At that time, the plantation was almost 8,000 acres in size. It wasn't the largest plantation in Virginia, but it was certainly among those, the largest. And you can see that it is uh, divided up into various groups. The four farms that I mentioned, uh, River Farm, Muddy Hole, Dobe Run, and Union Farm. And then here is the uh, Mansion House Farm, where the Washingtons are living, where, that, where obviously uh, Mount Vernon is located. And then over here to the far left is where the grist mill and distillery and cooperage was located. So it was sort of a separate node of commercial activity. And so several of the tradespeople uh, that I mentioned before are also actually working there. So you can see that it's a very diverse operation. It's well organized. Washington uh, in the 1790s essentially reinvented his plantation to try to make it a more efficient operation. Uh, he was very interested in following sort of uh, innovative practices in agriculture. And so he, he adopts those. You'll see that the farms are actually divided up into fields that are numbered. Each one of them is numbered and that relates to his new system of crop rotation that he initiates uh, in the 1780s uh, as part of this new farming practice. Talk about the Mansion House Farm a little bit. Of course, that's where the Washingtons are living. Uh, the map, the plan on the left by Samuel Vaughn uh, made in 1787 shows the core of the plantation. So we have, oops, we have the mansion, Mansion House at the top here, the various outbuildings that are directly associated with that. It's a very uh, elaborately planned, designed, elite landscape. So there's picturesque walkways, there's gardens, there's all the things that we come to expect uh, from elite colonial plantations. Over here to the left is the greenhouse, and here is the uh, slave quarter that was located there, with the main slave quarter where most, most of the individuals working at the Mansion House farm uh, we're living, and this is a painting of that building, so you can see it's a large structure. We have no idea how it was organized inside, um, but there were probably up to 50 people living in this building. So that makes us wonder, of course, exactly how that was organized. Uh, over here to the left, you'll also notice these red, cir red circles are indicating where new slave quarters were built in 1792 to replace this building. Okay, so bear that, bear that in mind. And this is, of course, is very, a very rare example. We have very few uh, plans uh, such as this uh, to be able to, to work with uh, in terms of plantation landscapes. Archaeology, uh, back in the 1980s, we excavated uh, a cellar here that was uh, located beneath the slave quarter that was replaced in 1792. Uh, and it had been used as a handy uh, trash depository for many years. And so when we excavated it, it was layer upon layer of domestic refuse. All these objects here came out of the slave quarter. Uh, and you can see uh, the excavation of that's ongoing. Uh, this is one of the largest collections of artifacts associated with an 18th century slave quarter at the time, uh, and frankly remains so today. 
uh, with a real a richness of, of materials. Now, looking at these objects, your first reaction might be, are these really associated with slaves? We're looking at, at porcelain, we're looking at uh, stemware, uh, white soft clay stoneware, uh, objects that, that of the type that you would think are normally associated with the planter family and not with the enslaved. Well, what we now know is that this is not a, a big surprise. In 1987, when we dug it, it was a fairly large surprise. But what's happened over the last 30 years is, as archaeologists have excavated more and more, and Mark will talk more about that, I think, uh, we have found uh, some really interesting patterns in terms of the material culture associated with the enslaved. And what do you know, not surprising, it depends very importantly on where those folks are living, uh, the conditions of their life, uh, the roles that they're playing either on the plantation or elsewhere. And so it's not a surprise to find that uh, artifacts associated, uh, material culture associated with slaves is going to vary according to a lot of these different conditions. And so this is a situation uh, where we think this is going on. So these objects uh, undoubtedly started in the Washington household. They were either handed down to these folks for their use when they were no longer uh, needed by the Washingtons or, or were maybe broken or whatever. Uh, there's also the possibility of, of theft, of course. Um, and so this assemblage has a lot of, of sort of interesting different meanings uh, that, you can, that you can derive from it. This is a uh, drawing of the slave quarters that were added in 1792. So this is the existing greenhouse and then these wings, these brick wings were added in 1792. Uh, both of them were, uh, were used for uh, quartering slaves. You can see the description, they're 70 feet long, 74 feet long, uh, 20 feet wide, uh, one story in height. Why did Washington do this? Well, it may have been, of course, that the older building simply was beyond repair and needed to be replaced, but this was a major statement on his part. Um, these building, this building uh, is very pretentious architecturally. You know, it matches very much with the architecture of the other buildings, especially the greenhouse uh, on, on, at the Mansion House Farm, and is very, very, very different from the types of habitations that most of the slaves living at, at Mount Vernon were living in. So again, this is a very unusual representation of, of uh, slave conditions, uh, both at Mount Vernon and throughout the Chesapeake. The interior of the building, we know from Washington's plans that it was divided into four two rooms on each side, four large rooms. Um, and the uh, little bit of, of documentary evidence that we have indicates that they were sort of, they were laid out in a, in a barrack style uh, with these very, very, uh, you know, uh, not very family oriented, uh, you know, conditions in there. For many years, this was a lot, uh, a point of conjecture, uh, conjecture rather, you know, why did Washington do this? Well, for two reasons, we think. Number one is that uh, there was a single door coming into each one of these rooms, onto the lane. And so what that meant is that any individual standing on the lane would see who was coming and who was going uh, into these buildings. We know from Washington's uh, uh, correspondence with his uh, head overseer that that was a concern of his, that he was uh, concerned that the slaves at the Mansion House farm were basically uncontrolled, that they were largely unsupervised. And so this is, I think, Washington's attempt to change that situation and by creating a living conditions that allowed them to be very highly supervised. The second thing is that the community of slaves uh, at the Mansion House Farm uh, is, is very unrepresentative. Of the 90 individuals that were living there, about a third of them consisted of family groups. And by that I mean a uh, man, a wife, and children, and they were living at the plantation. They were not living in this building. They were living elsewhere. The other individuals, the remaining 60 or so people that were living here, uh, were primarily uh, single adults, single males, single women, with a much smaller number of women and children. Why is, why is this the situation? Well, because the um, marriages at Mount Vernon, while they were recognized, that didn't mean that they, the families would not be split up among the plantation. So most of the tradesmen, the craftspeople, were males. And so they're living here at the Mansion House Farm where most of their work is being uh, carried out. They may have had families that were living at one of the outlying farms. 
right? And so this then now makes more sense as a barracks type of situation because that's, that's essentially what it was. Here's a model that we made several years back that uh, shows the greenhouse, the new slave quarters, and you can see the greenhouse, of course, is fronting onto this very elaborate, uh, very formal designed garden that Washington laid out beginning in the 1760s and then uh, made changes to throughout his lifetime. So the doors leading into the slave quarters are facing <coughs> this direction. So they are not facing in this direction. So they're obviously facing um, you know, away from the mansion. These are what we think are the slave cabins where the six families lived. You can see their log structures. Um, and so between the two of them, they're forming essentially a lane, um, a black workspace and living space that is separated uh, off from the rest of the plantation. So this fits the, uh, Washington's idea of he's trying to you know, more closely supervise these individuals, put them in a position um, you know, where, where, where they could control that. Uh, other activities on the plantation, of course, there are blacksmiths. Um, this is the location of the blacksmith shop, which again was very near where the slave quarters was. We excavated there and we were able to reconstruct the blacksmith shop a number of years back. So when you go to visit, uh, you can actually see that. Uh, the fishery, uh, Mount Vernon is located on the Potomac and so harvesting uh, fish in the spring uh, to augment the rations of the slave and also as a source of revenue uh, was a major operation. Out at the five farms, of course, it was a different situation. Again, Washington reorganized the farms in the 1790s to make them more efficient. You'll notice here at Union Farm, these are the slave quarters, and this is the overseer's house. So again, sort of similar to what's going on at the Mansion House Farm, the overseer's house is directly lo located directly across from the slave quarters. Um, and obviously allowing you know, greater surveillance, probably a greater level of control over those individuals. And this was done at all the outlying farms. Uh, this is uh, at Dog Run Farm. And you can see again a line of slave quarters located here. Washington, as I mentioned before, was very interested in scientific farming following English progressive ideas of agriculture. I mentioned the fields being divided up uh, and this is a crop rotation plan that Washington developed so that every year the field would be planted in a different crop. It would be corn one year, wheat one year, left fallow, et cetera. And of course, who's doing this? Who's carrying this out? Of course, it's, it's the farm workers. Um, and they had been growing tobacco up until the 1760s. Washington then transferred to growing wheat. And then in the 1780s, he changes again to adopt these new ideas and practices of farming. So these are the folks who would have been uh, put in the position of making that work. Washington had some frustration with that. He wasn't particularly pleased with the outcome of many of these efforts. Um, sitting here 200 years later, we might suspect that uh, what motivation did, the, did these workers have to really learn these new processes and go out of their way uh, to, make, to, to make this work. Um, buildings, I mentioned uh, again out at the Mansion House Farm, uh, they were living in very different structures. They were much more typical of the buildings of the time period. They would have been log structures, and you can see log buildings were the most typical building of the time period. It would have looked more like this building on the left. Of course, none of those survive. Um, and, in and in general terms in the Chesapeake, um, log buildings are underrepresented uh, in the existing uh, collection of buildings. Most of them are much higher, the brick and masonry and, and frame buildings that would have not been the typical building of the time, but which have been preserved because they were probably better built to begin with and also uh, were more adaptable to other uses. We found evidence for one of Washington's cabins, and here's a reconstruction of that building, again at Mount Vernon where you can come uh, and you can see this. This would have been uh, housing for a single family. In this case, we interpret it as the family of Slam and Joe and Priscilla. Joe lived at the Mansion House Farm, uh, and his family would have lived at Dog Run Farm. The description of the interior of these, of these uh, cabins, again, they're more miserable than the, miser than the most miserable of the cottages of our peasants, a very typical kind of comment made by visitors at the time. But interestingly, but in the middle of this poverty, some cups and a teapot. So again, this visitor was commenting on sort of juxtapositions how there were some things there that did not match with his expectation of what he was finding. 
Uh, Washington, again, was uh, very commercially oriented, built a distillery. It was one of the largest distilleries in America when it was constructed in 1797. And again, it was run uh, by six enslaved workers working under the direction uh, of a hired distillery, or distiller, rather. The same with his grist mill here, again, a major operation, again, using enslaved labor. And I'll just conclude with coming back to this handsome individual, Hercules, Washington's cook. Hercules went with George Washington to New York and Philadelphia when he uh, became president and worked for him there. In Philadelphia, Washington had a, had a problem in that the state of Pennsylvania had adopted a law that any slave living in Pennsylvania for six months or more would be freed. Washington knew this and he uh, worked around this. So what he would do is he would take his, the slaves with him to Philadelphia before six months had passed he would take them back to Mount Vernon. So that then when they came back to Philadelphia, the six month time period would start again. Hercules apparently uh, was unhappy with this. Washington took him back to Mount Vernon in 1797, uh, January of 1797. On February 22nd, 1797, he ran away um, from Mount Vernon and, and never returned. And so, uh, obviously a number of meanings here. One of them is that this is that this was one of the slaves at Mount Vernon who probably re received quote unquote the best treatment was um, you know uh, perceived as being at the very highest of the of the hierarchy among the enslaved at Mount Vernon but for him obviously uh, freedom was much more important uh, than slavery. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pogue. Uh, again, we will hold all the questions until the, um, all the speakers um, have made their presentations. The, um, our next speaker is uh, Mark Leone. He's a professor of anthropology at the University of Maryland here, having received a BA in history from Tufts and an MA and a PhD in anthropology from the University of Arizona. He came to the University of Maryland in 1976. He is the director of the University of Maryland's Archaeology in Annapolis program. Over 400 undergraduate archaeologists have been trained in Annapolis through the University of Maryland's Field School. His research includes his research areas include North American anthropology, historical anthropology, and outdoor history museums. Since 2000. Professor Leone has also directed research on Maryland's Eastern Shore at the William Packer 1792 Plantation on Y Island, and as, as well as at the Y House Plantation, where Frederick Douglass was enslaved as a child. He was born, he was one of the curators of the Joint Heritage at Y House exhibit in 2013 that explored the coexisting African American and European cultures at the plantation in the 18th and 19th centuries by drawing on the archaeological evidence from the slave quarters and from the historic uh, greenhouse. I did have an opportunity to, to go to the greenhouse and I stumbled on uh, Dr. Uh, Leone's um, uh, presentation that was done back, I believe, in August. It was on YouTube and, I, and it just gave me a whole different perspective of what I had seen when I was, uh, when I was touring the, the the uh, greenhouse. So I do recommend it. just to uh, Google it and take a look at it on YouTube. Uh, Dr. Leone. Welcome to the university. Um, I want to thank Susan Pearl for her invitation. Um, the invitation has produced the experiment that is in this paper. Um, the purpose of the paper is to figure out how our archaeological work of the last 20, 25 years figures into the founding of Maryland Afro-Christianity. So that's the topic of the paper. Um, I also want to thank Doug McElrath and Lauren Brown, who have accepted the entire paper, film, and map record of archaeology in Annapolis into this building. Um, I also want to recognize the many former students of mine who are here. Um, and I say all of this 
to celebrate the commitment of the University of Maryland, not only to historical archaeology, but to African American historical archaeology. Um, so um, this is new enough so that I have to read it. Um, Frederick Douglass was born at about the time the War of 1812 closed. Just as he said later that the 4th of July meant nothing to African Americans of his time, so he would have said the same about this second war <clears throat> for American independence. On the other hand, however, we want to ask what would have interested him um, that happened early in his lifetime and that had to do with freedom for Africans and African Americans. The answer lies in the topic that you have given me for today's symposium. And given that since 1990, archaeologists working through the University of Maryland in Annapolis on the Eastern Shore have found and identified much archaeology related to West African religion. Our objective today is to say what this is um, and how it is related to freedom of the kind Douglas foresaw and helped to establish. And the we here is my many graduate students who are co-authors here. African Americans were and always are fighting for freedom and for independence. We should never see slavery as given or as static. No anthropologist would ever say it is inevitable. Its circumstances are variable. Slavery exists under some circumstances and not in others. The opposite of slavery, however, is not freedom. The opposite is some form of society that does not use slavery, but probably in the last 5,000 years, some other form of oppression. Um, what we have to start with is the inevitability of resistance to slavery. No one ever was a slave willingly, nor can we assume a static system within slavery. This is true both in ancient slave societies like Rome and on our own in North America. <clears throat> the most important African-American free institution we can associate with the War of 1812 is the founding and spread of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, known as the AME Church, by most people. How is the emergence of this church tied to our archaeological work? That's the basic question. The MA Church in Annapolis, its members, and two AME institutions and their members on the Eastern Shore have been the initiators and sponsors of our archaeological work in Annapolis and at White House and in Easton itself. It is all connected to Frederick Douglass and his work. Before 1990, members of the Banneker Douglass Museum including former members of the Mount Moriah AME Church, the museum's home currently, and community members from the congregation along Franklin Street in Annapolis, established our research questions on our access to community oral history and understanding of the archaeology from the block, a whole block in central Annapolis. St. Stephen's AME Church in Unionville, Talbot County, and other church members in Easton all directed, supported, defended, verified, and built upon our archaeology at White House and in the early free African-American community in Eastern Maryland. Even though I didn't know it until about now, members of the AME Church directed the archaeology of the question, did anything from the period of the War of 1812 enhance and celebrate freedom for African-Americans? This serendipity turned into cause when the African name of the AME Church becomes a focus, not just an initial, and is seen as a continuation with Africa, not an indication only to remember Africa. We have recovered four kinds of archaeological material that lead to understanding how we might provide some context to what Afri the African in the AME might mean, or at least come from. We have excavated many iron objects, many round reflecting <coughs> objects, many circular objects, and the pollen of many plants with healing properties. I'm going to use that later to get to John the Conqueror. Since 1990, we have excavated about 10 sites in Annapolis associated with African Americans. These date from 1720 to 1920 and contain religious objects associated with African and African American practices. Many of these sites come right up to the urban renewal period of the 1950s and 60s in Annapolis. Others come up to the period of gentrification in Annapolis, which has never stopped as you all know, who are associated with historic preservation. Objects associated with West African religious practices end around 1920, however, but and the last of them occurred at the Slayton House opposite St. Mary's Church in Annapolis. Many ethnic groups of Africans were enslaved here and came from a wide range of African homes, tribes, and nations. <clears throat> 
They practiced a wide variety of religions, and some of these were influenced by Islam and Christianity. By, but by 1750 or 1800, the amalgam of West African religious traditions was, crea was, was created, and it's usually called hoodoo. This term has reemerged in the last five or so years and is no longer associated with disrespect or racism. In our early work in Annapolis, we adopted the term West African spirit practices to avoid racist implications. But I think we can return now to the term hoodoo. I hope, but I'm not sure. That's why this is experimental. As hoodoo emerges, so does the healing and protective West African tradition that accompanied African religions, and this is called conjure. Conjure has a native pharmacopoeia available through, that we know about through traditions, the slave narratives, and archeological pollen analyses. Hoodoo is associated with two-headed or two-faced doctors who could foresee events, communicate traditions, and carry a group's historical memory. There is a possibility that Harriet Tubman may have been a two-headed doctor with the ability to foresee things, and at least one scholar sees Douglas as a griot, one deeply knowledgeable about his people's past and its meaning in the present. On a historical level, hoodoo is parallel to Santeria, Condomble, Polo Mayombe, and Voudun, but it has no priesthood, or if it does, a very scattered one. Therefore, there may have been kinds of hoodoo, and there probably was. Every one of these New World expressions of African religions absorbs Christianity. However, hoodoo is influenced by and absorbs Protestant Christianity, whereas all the others have ties and make ties to Catholicism. This is a process known in the scholarly world, it's very well known, and is seen as producing Afro-Christianity, another a standard term, which includes the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Our archeology span forces us to see that Afro-Christianity absorbs the qualities, the qualities of Shango that are manifested through iron. It, it isn't at all that Shango is incorporated into and can be found in any African-American church. That would make such a church something that it isn't. It is that strength, fire, the forge, the tools of civilization, and of defenses are found in the Christian deity and his people, and when the elements of Shango are wedded to Afro-Christianity. In particular, in this case, the AME Church. And here's a quote from Elsie Clues Parsons, one of the founders of American anthropology. Still others consider the water from the forging process sacred as it has been regarded by their African ancestors. And they used water in their church's indoor pool when the practice of baptizing in the river significantly declined. You can see from the images in the loop here, and they, they'll be, it'll go through three times, um, the intense use of iron objects in Annapolis and at White House. The bundle from Fleet Street, Fleet Street in Annapolis, which dates to 1740 at the latest, was placed in running water and at least had had at least 300 pieces of shot, of course, inherently round, in it, many iron nails, pins, and a rivet. These are all shown in the x-rays. <clears throat> a very large and we believe significant deposits with many iron implements in it were found beneath the slave quarter at a tenant's house in Y House, at Y House, and that this dates from the 1860s to about 1900. What's new here is we've excavated this over the last three or four years, and we've never talked about this before. Um, we, in fact, we didn't even know what it was until about two and a half years ago. One part of the deposit contains hoe blades, axe heads, pitchforks, and a lawnmower blade. Another section contains an iron wheel, a circle of crushed tin cans, and some canning jar lids. So we have iron and we have circles. Um, <coughs> The deposit at White House contains at least 50 objects, most organized as circles. While much is composed of iron objects, much is made of glass in the form of discs. You can see a deliberately chipped base of a very large bottle. Glass, crystals, decanter stoppers, and mirroring objects are connected to catching the spirits of another world, the next and after death, and convincing the spirit to do some human purpose. The famous slave narratives list these as healing, curing, protection, and sometimes punishing or retribution. The central element from Africa is the human ability to entice a spirit or a supernatural power to work for human ends. If captured, the spirit must do the human will. It must do our will. When taken into Christianity, this translates into a 
relationship of the kind that Moses had to God and Jesus to his father. They did each other's work when asked. It was not a passive relationship. As archaeologists, we can see this through the extensive use of reflecting glass. The best known hoodoo assemblage we have discovered is at the Charles Carroll House, and I, I'm, that's pretty well known, so I'll skip. Um, from the same period at Y House is a bundle at the threshold of a slave quarter in the greenhouse on the property. The bundle dates from the quarter's use, which was 1790 to 1820. It contains two projectile points, each with reflecting surfaces. A pestle made of hard stone with quartz inclusions was found nearby, acting as the keystone of the famous fireplace in the Y House greenhouse, and its use dates to the early 19th century. So far, there are bundles. Then there are large flat deposits containing glasses, containers, and reflective discs are at, at, at Bryce House in Annapolis and beneath the slave quarter at Y House. And these are organized as circles. Um, they are both very large and complex and date to after emancipation. This is crucial in understanding um, how hoodoo evolves um, and then to 1900, which is the very time when hoodoo reached its peak in North America. It is both the reflective quality and the containing quality of the glass vessels in these deposits that I think matters. A bottle can contain a spirit and stop it up. Um, a shiny surface acts as a mirror and the flash is the operation of the spirit, the actual operation of the spirit. Here is the hypothesis then that links everything together and it comes from Katrina Hazard Donald, an African-American scholar at Rutgers uh, Camden. Quote, the African priest who would evolve into the plantation conjurer and later into the plantation's black preacher possessed spiritual power in the ring shout. In addition, he was the likely individual who could seek out Native American spiritual knowledge to augment his communities and his own and his community's knowledge. The key here is not only that the shout, but that the circle of which we have only some evidence yet, um, uh, it, it, as well as the transformation of an African spiritual leader into a black preacher. Quote, both bondsmen and freedom, freedmen insisted on hearing to both traditional African religious patterns and their newly accepted Christian expressions of faith, convening the sacred circle, one of numerous African religious practices, um, which was just a means of doing this. And this is a quote then from um, one of the founding uh, bishops um, of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the first president of Wilberforce University. This young man, a convert, or rather an adherent, insisted that sinners won't, con con won't get converted unless there is a ring. At camp meeting, there must be a ring. There must be a ring there, there must be a ring over yonder, or sinners will not get converted. So the notion of a ring is central. The deposit at White House has not only a lot of iron, but also round objects made of glass and tin cans and laid out in circles. There is a wheel hub, a circle of crushed tin cans, and a circle of canning jar pieces. There is also a large glass disc. The context is 1860 to 1900. Now to conclude, we can add the iron, the circles, the reflective objects, and the medicinal plants whose pollen we have from uh, several spots at Y House. And um, Katrina Hazard Donald allows us to see that the roots, Hai John the Conqueror in particular, Jesus, Shango, are collateral or analogous spiritual forces. This is particularly significant here. Hai John was not merely a hope bringer, he was also an intermediary between man and God, a warrior martyr, dying for us, a soul saver, a sustainer, and a virtual saint in the old Huda religion. So these are concepts, these are not things. The things are simply the things. It's what they stand for and contain that is so significant. Through the iron, the flash of Shango, the herbs of John the Conqueror, and the ring of West Africa, we have the African environment of the founding of Maryland Afro-Christianity. And that's why this is significant during the War of 1812. Not that it had anything to do with the War of 1812, and including the founding of the AME Church, which is about that time. We do not have the details, we do not have the proof, we do not have the whole story, but we have an archaeological archive never before opened. It is a parallel fight for freedom, uh, parallel to the War of 1812. We can see its success best not in the Star Spangled Banner, 
but rather in the new statue to Frederick Douglass in Easton, his home and home to early AME churches. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Leone. Um, now we have Maya Davis. Uh, she is a research arch archivist with the Legacy of Slavery Project at the Maryland State Archives in Annapolis. The Legacy of Slavery Program seeks to preserve and promote the vast universe of experiences that have shaped the lives of Maryland's African American population. It demonstrates how Marylanders of cover, color have adapted and prevailed despite what often seem like insurmountable odds. Her research projects have included the Underground Railroad in Maryland, Maryland Emancipation, and Slave Escapes during the War of 1812. She holds degrees from Howard University and George Washington University. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being patient with me. I had a little problem getting around the university. I got lost, so <laughs> Howard and Georgetown, George Washington are not this huge, so it took a minute. Um, as you said before, I am a research archivist at the Maryland State Archives, and slavery is pretty much my life, 19th century slavery most often. Um, when this project was brought to me, I had a big frown on my face because I really focused on those slaves that escaped on the Underground Railroad. And I did not want to touch the War of 1812. Why? Because in my history classes over the years, I had never heard anything about a black person being involved in the War of 1812. So when it was brought to me, I said, okay, I've been working on slavery pretty much all of my career, and now you want me to start working on the War of 1812. You know, there's pretty much no women working on this topic. Um, you know, it's a man's war. It's almost the war that's forgotten about. You hear about the Revolutionary War. You hear about the Civil War. But, you know, the War of 1812, what am I going to do with this? So, you know, Dr. Pappenfuss, he swayed me a little bit, and I said, okay. He sent me to the National Archives, and that's where my research began. Um, what I was supposed to do when I first got there was to look up one person who lost a slave during the War of 1812. And I'm thinking to myself, we have a hundred years of slaves escaping. I mean, slaves have been escaping from Maryland since the very day they touched down on this continent. So why am I gonna be excited about one slave? We can look him up here and we can just write a story about it. So when I got to the National Archives, I went and I looked for this one person. I had all my sources that I was to look at and I pulled out a book called The Definitive List. I opened it and my mind was blown immediately. There were thousands of slaves that ran away during the War of 1812, not just in Maryland, but in Virginia, Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, Washington, D.C. And I said, oh, this may not be too bad after all. <laughs> you know, so what the goal was, was to get that information. And so I told Dr. Pappas, I said, you're not going to believe what I just found. And he was so excited and so supportive. And I said, well, you know, forget what I said about being a specialist of the Underground Railroad. I'll push forward and we'll make this happen. And so I spent months, probably the better part of a year, at the National Archives trying to get all this information. Uh, the case files, which are, which are like thousands of depositions and letters to the Department of State, you know, for people trying to get compensation, reparations. And I said, wait a minute, we don't talk about reparations. We don't like to anyway. And you know, I'm like, what's going on here? So what the goal was, was to get all this information from the National Archives and bring it back to the Maryland State Archives and make a comparison between the records that we held at the Maryland State Archives. And what happened next was just a bevy of information. And I, when I say we have worked on this, it was me. <laughs> I worked on this by myself for pretty much four years prior to you know, the celebrations coming on. Um, it was a labor of love, I have to tell you. And luckily for me, I am a student of the internet. <laughs> you know, we are trained to work in the archives and look at the original records, but I have to admit, my first start always starts with Google. And when I looked for some of the names that I had found at the National Archives, I looked at Google, and 
it brought me to the Nova Scotia archives, which I had no idea that they had a bevy of information scanned related to these slaves that had escaped from the Chesapeake during the War of 1812. And so it became a bigger process than we ever even imagined. Some 700 plus slaves leaving the Chesapeake and going and settling in numerous places. So I'm gonna start and talk about the British impact. And like I said, I am by no means a War of 1812 expert. I'm an expert of slaves and the individuals that flee. And so I was forced to look at, you know, how this whole war shaped the enslaved community here in Maryland. And so the impact began with the British showing up and placing a blockade on Maryland waterways. And, you know, people always discredit slaves and they don't think that they're going to go off and do anything. They're much smarter than you think. These are people who are very familiar with the waterways. They've been working on shipping long before the British showed up. So when they show up in 1813, they're already running away. And it's important that I note that slaves are running away to the British. They're running away on their own accord. So it, the pattern doesn't change just because the British show up. Slaves have been running away in the 1700s, early 1800s. But when they show up in 1813, some of the slaves say, look, this is our opportunity to escape. And you know, the British recognize this as a good partnership. You know, they don't know how to get around water, Maryland waterways. Who do you think knows? It's the slaves. They know how to manipulate these waterways, how to get around. They know where all the plantations are. And so what ends up happening is that in the following year, Admiral Cochran, who's in Bermuda, issuing orders on the War of 1812, issues out a proclamation that offers immediate emancipation to anyone looking to be free, take up arms against the American forces, and be resettled in a British territory. Now, I've gotten in trouble with many scholars as we do these presentations, and they say, well, that wasn't really directed at slaves. I ask you, in 1814, who wants to be free more than the slave? I mean, just think about it. He doesn't say it implicitly, but this is who's running to the ships. The information is there. I mean, just look at it. And like gossip today, it works pretty much the same then. You know, everyone's talking about it. The nerve of him to issue this proclamation and, you know, encourage and entice our slaves to run off. And they do, by the hundreds. So looking into Bladensburg, I hadn't really concentrated on Bladensburg as much. You know, I am a Washington, D.C. native. I live in Prince George's County, but I live in Oxon Hill, which, you know, even though we are a huge county in the way of, you know, counties they go, but, you know, Bladensburg is a whole other world for me. So I knew nothing about it, but then Susan called me and she said, could you please do this presentation for us on Bladensburg? And I said, eh, yeah, we can do that. Let, we'll make it work. So, you know, keep in mind that, you know, the War of 1812, there's things that are just happening in certain locations. So you have General Robert Ross, this is who you're going to see in Bladensburg. This is the guy who burns Washington. He's at the Black Battle of Bladensburg. His horse is shot from under him. He is responsible for carrying off all the slaves that would have left from Bladensburg. I'm going to look at the escapes from Zachariah Berry, Tillman Hillary, and Thomas Bowie. Those are the three slave owners who would have lost slaves in Bladensburg. I haven't found any additional slaves that have left out of Bladensburg, but that doesn't mean that there weren't. Like I said before, there are slaves who leave and they go off on their own accord, and then there are those who go off to the British. For the purpose of this exhibit, I only focus on the slaves who are going off with the British. Uh, at the time that Robert Ross is retreating from Washington and he's going back through Bladensburg is when he picks up the slaves. They are going to march to Benedict, and on the way they will stop in Upper Marlboro, and they will pick up additional slaves. And what I love about this whole process is that it's very much a community-driven process, this escape. You know, a lot of times we hear information about men not caring about their families on the Underground Railroad, that they have to think about themselves and they run off and the women can't leave because they're tied to their families. But this isn't the case during the War of 1812. Many times you see men running off to British ships and bargaining with the British and saying, you know what, I will fight for you against the Americans, but I am not going to do it unless you allow me to help free my family. So you see that a lot during the War of 1812, a lot of running off and coming back and armed. 
the mistresses are overwhelmed, you know, the masters are overwhelmed. They're saying, you know, they're walking around armed. Can you believe it? A slave armed as if he's a soldier? They're shocked. You know, I mean, they are really just can't get over it. And so you see this trend all up and down. You know, it's not just Prince George's County. The bulk of the slaves, they escape from Prince George's, Calvert, St. Mary's County, Anne Arundel. This is where your largest concentration of slaves will escape during the War of 1812. So, you know, just looking at Prince George's County and who all escaped, these are the areas where they would have escaped from. A large contingent from the Piscataway, Fort Washington area which at that time would have been Fort Warburton, before today we'll call it Fort Washington. Um, you have those leaving Upper Marlboro. You have those who actually go with General Ross, but then there's another contingent that go elsewhere. And then you have the Bladensburg group, which is a smaller group amongst the slaves that have left from Prince George's County. You have Nottingham and Aquasco. And you know, for those who are experts on slavery in Virginia, those that leave in Nottingham and Aquasco, those slaves belong to the daughter of George Mason's, of George Mason's daughter and her husband, Ronaldo Johnson. So, you know, keep in mind, slaves are very mobile at this time. Not only are they being hired out, they're being willed to family members. And so they're very familiar with the lay of the land. You know, they get out and they're working. They know how to maneuver and get around. So just imagine, you know, George Mason's daughter, Ann Mason Johnson, she actually brought those slaves with her from Virginia to Maryland. And these people are all along the Potomac and the Patuxent. They're leaving out of Alexandria. And you just wouldn't believe how big the network is. And this image that you see here, Gabriel Hall, I call him the face of the black refugees who would have escaped during the War of 1812. This is the only known image of a War of 1812 refugee. The only. So, you know, we got this from the Nova Scotia archives. And although he's from Calvert County, I like to show him because I feel like he reflects all of them that would have left during that time. The first group of slaves that would have left, the Rideout brothers. These are two brothers, Andrew and Peter Rideout. They escaped from Tillman Hillary, who, if you know anything about the Hillary family, they are having slave escapes for years before and after the war. My guess is that Tillman Hillary was some jerk. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, to have slaves repeatedly run from you. You know, most slave owners may have one slave who's a repeat offender. But I mean, multiple slaves. I mean, if you know anything about the plumbers, they were owned by Tillman Hillary. And you know, you know their history. They're running away. You know, their uncles are running away. Their aunts are running away. It's pretty much a running away feast. You know, you just can't stop running away from Tillman Hillary. And I have to think that his overseer must not be that great. <laughs> you know, he's not doing his job. But uh, Andrew and Peter Rideout, they actually enlist in the Colonial Marines. The Colonial Marines is the African-American Corps branch of the British Royal Marines. And it is an all-black branch of the Marines. And they enlist, and they set up on Christopher Gant's property in Bladensburg. And they're enlisting slaves right there in the face of their owners. We're going to enlist them in the Colonial Marines, and they will fight against you. And George Coburn, Rear Admiral George Coburn of the British military, he admitted that the black soldiers were least likely to desert and they were better fighters than the men that he brought with him from Britain. And I mean, that just spoke volumes to me. It, these people that have been, you know, enslaved not just physically but also in the mind are now rising up and saying, you know what, I've had enough, and if I have to take you down in the process, I will. You know, and they're very aggressive, I will tell you. They are very aggressive. Uh, there's been instances of slaves marching into the homes of their owners and saying, if you don't hand over my daughter, I will burn this house to hell. And I thought to myself, I have to use that line one day. I really got to use it. <laughs> you know, it, it was just so great. It read like a movie. But I mean, they're really aggressive. And their owners, they're fighting. They're fighting because now you have to fight two people. You have to fight the British and you have to fight your former property. And you have to keep in mind that at this time, their property, they don't see them in the same way that you and I see eye to eye. You know, as you know, on the list, they're listed right under the cups, the plates, the forks, the cows, the sheep. You know, this is all on a list. But I will say, oftentimes, they are most valuable. <laughs>
So as I said, Andrew and Peter Rideout, they're the first enlist in the Colonial Marines. And so then you see more people starting to escape. The slaves of Zachariah Berry, and if anybody's inf uh, familiar with Bladensburg, you know that Zachariah Berry is one of the largest slaveholders in Prince George's County. I have to admit, you know, I get frustrated a lot because these people want to name themselves over and over and over again. So I'm like, well, which Zachariah Berry is this? Finally, you know, figured that out. He's the father of Thomas and Zachariah Jr. So, you know, if you know anything about Oxen Hill, Maryland, there's Thomas Berry of Oxen Hill. So now I know who I'm dealing with. But not only are the owners, you know, their family relationships, you can kind of track the slave relationships. And that's so important and integral. You know, you see these people at different plantations and it start, this type of thing brings it together and you can kind of see those familiar relationships. You know, you have three men here, Richard Spriggs, Harkless Lowe, which, you know, in some records he listed as Hercules. And then you have Michael Duckett. I thought this was an interesting way to spell Michael, but Michael Duckett. And, you know, their families, these family connections, they're encouraging each other to run off, as I said before. You know, they know, they're very familiar. These cross-plantation escapes is not a uh, new concept. You know, they go off and they know people, they have friends and families at neighboring plantations and they're encouraging to, them to run off as well. Bladensburg is one of the only towns that I've seen in all of this research where all of the men that escaped from Bladensburg enlisted in the Colonial Marines, which I thought was very interesting, which said a lot to me about the gusto in Bladensburg. You also had the slaves of Thomas Bowie. Again, another person who I had to figure out, which Thomas Bowie is this? You know, it, it took quite some time, but you know, you know, measuring up records at the Maryland State Archives versus those from the National Archives, which I did not mention in the beginning, came from Record Group 76, which dealt with boundary claims. If you're interested in going to see information about enslaved flight during the War of 1812, Record Group 76, a massive group of records, you'll be there for months, I guarantee. But you have Jerry Covington and William Bess. And on the surface, it looks like, you know, you have two different men. They're brothers. Jerry Covington, he escapes from the Bladensburg plantation. And when they march through Upper Marlboro, sure enough, he picks up his brother, William Bess, who is, I mean, they're like night and day. Jerry Covington, short, dark skin, chubby, woolly hair. Negro escapes from Bladensburg. His brother, William Bass, half-brother, face and hair of a white man. That's how it's described in the records. And, you know, it's just amazing the, you know, the knowledge. I couldn't walk from Bladensburg to Upper Marlboro and know where to find my brother, I could tell you that, without a GPS. And the fact that, you know, they can kind of encourage the, the British to go and pick up their families. You know, they're bargaining. So, you know, it's really important to keep in mind the family relationships because this is the relationship they will continue to have moving forward when they resettle in other locations. This is the breakdown of what we found. In my database, we do a one-to-one -one match of the people that we've identified. We're constantly finding people. I had a lady email me two days ago to tell me there were two people she didn't see in my list online. So it's never ending. And, um, you know, you can look and see Prince George's County, 38 claimants, 109 fugitives. This is what we have to date. So the end of the war ends with the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, Christmas Eve, 1814. Now, what happens during this time is the slaves are supposed to, those that are still in British possession on American soil are supposed to be returned. It does not happen. It does not happen. You know, of course, you know, it takes a while for the message to get back that the war is over. So the British don't believe that it's over. You know, the Americans are asking for their slaves back, but they have to wait for word from their high-ranking officials to let them know that the war is over. So there are still slaves being held at the Tanger Island off the coast of Virginia, as well as on British ships. So, you know, this is pretty much illegal activity. You're holding these slaves. And you would think that they would, you know, once they got word, give them back. Nope. They take them and they resettle them in Nova Scotia, Trinidad. Some even go as far as Scotland and also London. It's amazing to me. If you know anything about John Weiss's work on Americans, that is the group of colonial Marines and their families that were resettled in Trinidad. 
Um, under the Treaty of Ghent, uh, we talk about these reparations again. This is the breakdown of what each state would have been, each individual in these states would have been compensated for the loss of their slaves on the War of 1812. Maryland and Virginia got the least amount. They were compensated $280 per slave that escaped to the British. You know, a lot of these slaves, especially those in Bladensburg, you know, the slave, the slave men ranged from $300 to $500 in value. Everyone from Bladensburg was worth $500. Rough coopers, carpenters, blacksmiths. They were highly skilled. So $280, that's nothing when you have someone that's worth $500. Now, if you have a little crippled old lady who hasn't been able to do work for you and she's worth $30, you've just profited greatly. Or a 10-year-old who's worth 75, you know, this is great, $280. But you know, when you have skilled laborers that are worth $500, this is a major loss. And before I go, I know I'm running short on time now, um, the key deponents, family, neighbors, other enslaved people who are still there, and free blacks. My favorite is Ben Orm, who was a slave of Tillman Hillary. Ben Orm told Tillman Hillary that he was with Andrew and Peter Rideout when they ran off. And they tried to get him to go with the British, but he said no, that he would stay and be a loyal slave. Ben Orm is a liar. <laughs> Not only do we have newspaper ads that indicate that Ben Orm ran away in 1812, he ran away in 1813 and 1815. He just wasn't as lucky or as good as Andrew and Peter Wright out at escaping. <laughs> and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Maya. So let's uh, open it up to uh, questions for our panel. Yes, do we need a microphone? Um, yeah, we've got one down there. Just, uh, I'll, I'll give you that. That record group 76, was that in the Maryland archive or the, the national archive? Yeah. The national would, would you just state your name? For your... I am Joseph Moore. And um, the last two you spoke to uh, about Thomas Bowie, enslaved person, uh, was William Best and, and Jerry. What was the last name of you? Thank you. Anything else that's over here? Um, are there black communities, my name's Dawn Young. Are there black communities, questions for Maya, are there black communities in Nova Scotia that can trace their roots back to um, the War of 1812 and also, I have a second question. Can you tell me a little bit more about it's the Merkins, right, in Trinidad? I want to hear a little bit more about them. Mm -hmm. There are black communities that are set up in Nova Scotia. Um, what I didn't get a chance to say about the group that left Bladensburg was I've not been able to trace this group to, Bladen, to Nova Scotia or Trinidad, but they were among the slaves that escaped that I saw where there were letters that were intercepted that came back from Leith, Scotland, and the UK. So there's a possibility that they settled in the UK. Um, there are numerous communities set up in Nova Scotia. There's Preston. You know, there's the Windsor Road. There's quite a few communities. If you go on the Nova Scotia Archives website, you can find those communities. And they do have plots of land where the slaves from the Chesapeake have been laid out on these plots of lands by name, and you can trace them that way. And the same thing with the Americans. Um, I would definitely suggest reading John Weiss's book because it lays out how the communities were formed. The communities in Trinidad were based on the companies you served in. So Company B would be a plot of land in you know, a certain part of Trinidad where you can find the list of those soldiers that served in Company B, Company A, you know, and so forth. Yes, right here in front. Um, I have a question for Mr. Pogue, is it? Pogue, yeah. Yes. Um, and you can maybe um, give me some clarification uh, where I'm wrong here. Um, I've always found the uh, situation with the slaves at Mount Vernon, Vernon to be particularly uh, complicated and complicated for George Washington himself um, because I believe he stated it at different times that it was a, a dilemma, a moral dilemma for him in terms of slavery. But the, what I'm trying to understand is that the dower slaves who were actually willed to marry Washington from her first husband, um, 
intermarried with the slaves that Washington himself owned um, and over a period of time uh, those families grew um, and from my understanding he did not free those he did not free his slaves that he personally owned or that he um, he owned prior to their union um, because these families had formed, um, and you also spoke to about uh, you spoke about the um, comments of the slaves being unruly. But at this point, there were uh, a few hundred slaves on the plantation, all of whom were related, um, and uh, that, that was pretty much their plantation at this point. Um, he didn't free those slaves because of these family units that had been created and he felt that uh, it would be best to free them after Mary Washington's death. But she decided to free those slaves a year after her death uh, because she felt like it was a dangerous situation for her to be in um, because she felt that uh, these, family, you know, these families would just be basically waiting for their freedom um, and that it was, you know, being alone on the plantation uh, with, with so many slave families. For some reason, someone, it was written that she, she had a fear for her life in some way. So since these dower, dower slaves were actually part of her estate, actually, and not Washington's, she didn't uh, end up freeing them at all and, and did release the slaves that, owned, uh, that were uh, owned by George Washington himself. Did that mean they had to leave the plantation? Because the dower slaves were then willed to her children after that as they were part of her first husband's estate, uh, the Custis estate. And were these families then broken up and never to be brought together again? Sure. Um, it's, a, it's a complex situation. Uh, I mentioned, you know, the dower slaves and Washington slaves and the fact that the dower slaves were not up, uh, George Washington and, and Martha Washington could not do anything with those. They were for her lifetime. And so George Washington, a uh, number of times, talks about a quandary that he sees in that by the 1780s, he uh, is very clearly making statements that he wants to uh, end slavery at Mount Vernon. He knows he can do that with his slaves, but knows that he cannot do that with the dower slaves. And of course, yes, by this time, you know, after all these years, those, uh, those groups had intermarried, and so it was a very complex situation. So he calls for freeing. He actually tried to sell some of his properties to raise the money to be able to free all of the slaves at the same time. Because he would have owed money to the Custis estate for the value of any of the Custis slaves that he freed. He tries to do this in the 17, in fact, the map that I showed that he drew in 1793, the reason he drew that map was that he was putting properties of his up for sale. And he was trying to simplify his own life and trying to raise money to enable him to do this. He fails in doing this. Nobody is willing to pay him the money that he thinks this property is worth. So what he then does is he, that he stipulates in his will that his slaves would be freed upon both his death and Martha's death. And in the will, uh, it's a very interesting document, he clearly states this, that he does not uh, want to be around, essentially, when this happens, because he knows this is going to cause the breakup of the families. Mm -hmm. He then dies, and Martha Washington uh, does decide to accelerate the terms of the will. And break up the family. It does break up the family. And it does break up the family. Mm -hmm. So in, on January 1st, 1801, um, the Washington slaves are freed. I forgot to mention that the family that I talked about, uh, Slam and Joe and his wife Priscilla, Slam and Joe was a Washington slave, Priscilla was a dower slave, all of their children therefore were dower slaves. And so when this happened, uh, Joe was freed and his, and his family would not have been freed. We don't know what happened on that day, uh, nobody talks about it, there's no you know, record but the Washington slaves were freed, and most of them did leave Mount Vernon. They dispersed. The Custis slaves continued there until Martha's death in 1802, and then the estate took over. And so she didn't actually will those slaves. They essentially reverted to her, um, her grandchildren at that time, because her children had died. So they took over that part of the estate. Some of them went to um, Tudor Place, with the Peter family, which had married into the Washingtons. 
some of them, uh, there were four grandchildren, uh, they, they were distributed among, among them. We don't know what happened to most of them. At, T at Tudor Place, they do actually have a lot of records uh, of these individuals, and so if you're interested, um, you, can, you can actually go there and find out some things. Some of them go to Arlington House, of course, um, and stay there. There's some records of them as well, but the point is, no, they were not freed, and yes, the families were broken up. Um, can I ask you then, in your opinion, does that perhaps suggest that some freed slaves actually yeah. decided to stay on plantations with their families? Um, uh, and I don't know if there's any record of that in the archives, you know, that uh, uh, freed slaves who may have been given their freedom where their families weren't decide to actually stay on the plantations to be with their, to stay with their families. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can only speak to Mount Vernon and we have no record of that. There's no evidence that that happened. Thank you. Yes, uh, I had a question uh, from my John Gianetti, and uh, I know your main concentration were on the slaves that escaped, yes. but there were a number of slaves or African Americans that were served with the flotilla. Exactly. And I was wondering if you had any information about those slaves, and were Very... you sort of fascinated by the fact that they were quite... Uh, good fighters and stuck with mm -hmm. Commodore Joshua Barney. Well, I haven't focused my concentration on, that's the next phase that we'll look at. Um, when we started this, we had no idea that the number that fought with the British was gonna be so large. We've had interns over the years that have worked with those prisoners that were impressed at Dartmoor, as well as you know, looking at Frederick Hall who escaped from Prince George's County, and also you know, George Roberts and things like that, but we've not looked at the large group of them to see, you know, what the outcome was, or been able to make any comparisons with the records that we have at the Maryland State Archives. Uh, Dick Charlton here. Uh, I've had the pleasure of serving with Sam Parker and uh, on the Maryland Historical Trust, and one of our uh, prominent members there, uh, Larry Gibson, uh, just recently completed a, a book on the young Thurgood Marshall, which I recommend to you. But uh, I had a conversation with him because he uh, has tracked back to his roots uh, some of uh, his family that uh, went to Nova Scotia. So he went up there and uh, visited with those people in the archives. He said, you just wouldn't believe it. He, gave, he told them his name, a little bit of background, and they came out with a stack of two, two feet of papers which uh, he, he said, tell anybody they're looking for their roots, that's the place to go. I'll pass that on to you. Larry Gibson, uh, and, and he could tell you more chapter and verse of, of all of that. Very interesting. I think we have time for one more question. A couple of questions. In regard to the work of Larry Gibson, we did assist him with his research, and it was through the work that we did with the National Archives where we found uh, relations to the Hall family. It's the Hall family out of St. Mary's County that Larry Gibson is tied into, which we have not made a connection between Gabriel Hall and this Hall family, but we believe that there likely is a connection considering the proximity. I have an ending question from um, the all of you all have looked at facts, and we all go back to <coughs> understanding what history uh, tells us about the past. But we're also cons uh, interested in what that portends for the future, especially as we look at culture, we look at um, uh, how people either survived or tried to survive. What do you think that can tell us about the future and, and how that relates to even some of the issues that society brings upon us today about understanding different cultures, different people. And, and related to that, is, is there any um, high priority research related to slavery that can take us to a, a better understanding of where we go to as opposed to where we have been? Any comments on Well, I guess since I have the mic, I'll start. <laughs> um, well, one question that I didn't answer, um, which this guy reminded me of, was you know, whether or not the people in Nova Scotia knew 
who their ancestors were. And when I started this, um, I noticed that the people in Nova Scotia, they only referenced their ancestors as Chesapeake slaves. They didn't know whether they were from Maryland or whether they were from Virginia. So I think, you know, we've reached great strides in making these connections between the three different repositories and, you know, in the way of history and genealogy, which genealogy has become such a big part of what historians are doing now because it's essential to know how these people are intertwined. And so the work that we're doing, we are just grateful that, you know, we're making connections. Um, one of the people that we've been in touch with is uh, Dr. Oliver in Nova Scotia, whose ancestors fled from out of Fort Washington, which he never knew that and he never was able to make any connections. So I think in that way, that's one of the strides that we're making. It's important that people know where they're coming from. You know, if you don't know where you're coming from, the saying goes, you don't know where you're going. And I, I definitely believe that at the bottom of my heart. Well, I, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by hearing what Maya and Mark had to say. I think that there's been an incredible uh, richness of scholarship that has blossomed over the last three decades and on, on slavery and, and the whole topic uh, of, of the roles of African Americans uh, in, in American history. Um, so I'm very encouraged. As an archaeologist, when I started back in the 70s, uh, there was very, had very little had been done on the topic uh, of slavery. And of course, it has mushroomed since then. Uh, I'm also encouraged because having worked at a place like Mount Vernon, the research that we did there um, and the research that we benefited from others doing was manifested actually on the plantation, on the site, in terms of interpretation. So we reconstructed a slave quarter, uh, we renovated the greenhouse slave quarter, you know, we introduced a lot of programs uh, on the enslaved community at Mount Vernon that wasn't there 30 years ago. Um, and so being someone who's, most of whose research has been sort of in that domain, where those results are meant to be interpreted, to be brought to the public, I'm very encouraged, not only at, at Mount Vernon, but at historic sites you know, throughout this area that have embraced this story and have brought it to their visitors' attention, um, knowing that it's a complex story to tell. Um, and it's not an easy thing uh, to discuss for many folks. But, but sites are doing that. And I think there's a lot more that can be done. But I'm very encouraged at the progress that's been made. There's a lot that I didn't know before, um, but seems to me the question that remains is how does slavery end? And uh, when you listen to the three of us, when we as a group of people listen to the War of 1812, the War of 1812 provided freedom, but it didn't provide emancipation. Look at what it took to provide emancipation. Three quarters of a million dead so what does it take to end slavery today? Not the symposium, Ferguson, Missouri. Um, I think we've had a great start to the day. Sim uh, very informative and stimulating conversation. Thank you all for your questions. Let's give our panel another round of applause.